This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. I'm Kristen Henderson, and with me is Siobhan Fallon. She's the author of You Know When the Men Are Gone, which is a collection of linked short stories about the families of an army brigade on Fort Hood, Texas, uh, which is a base in the middle of nowhere in Texas. Uh, my understanding is, Siobhan, that you started writing this while your own soldier husband was between his second and third Iraq deployments. Um, I wonder if you would start by reading a, a brief start of a, the last story in the collection called Gold Star. Sure. Thanks, Kristen. Okay. Let's see. Gold Star. Josie Schaefer drove around the commissary parking lot looking for a space. She had forgotten it was payday. She never shopped on payday when the bi-weekly paycheck was automatically deposited into every soldier's account in the United States Army at the same instant and therefore into the checkbooks of the 40,000 soldiers' families here at Fort Hood. The parking lot was a tangle of women pushing overflowing shopping carts, kids hanging on to the back or skidding around in wheeled sneakers, pickup trucks with their beds weighed down with toilet paper and diapers. Checking her watch again, she finally pulled into the empty Gold Star family designated spot in front. She waited a moment, peering at herself in the mirror, composing her face into what she imagined an ordinary face looked like, tugging her mouth into a smile, but then giving up. She knew the spouses walking by with their loaded carts were hesitating, trying not to stare into Josie's window, trading lifted eyebrows with the other women passing. As she got out and locked her car, a white-haired veteran paused by his truck in the Purple Heart recipient space a few feet away. He was wearing a black baseball cap with Vietnam embroidered in block letters across the front. He stepped across the line between them, his ropey veined hand outstretched. I'm grateful for your sacrifice, he said. Our country can never thank you enough. He made it sound as if she had willingly offered Eddie up. Josie shuddered but gave the man her hand. This is why she avoided the Gold Star sparking spots. Gold Star with its, with its imagery of school ch children receiving A's and stickers for a job well done was the military euphemism for losing a soldier in combat. Family members received a few special privileges like this parking spot, but that meant the pity rising from the asphalt, singed hotter than any Texas sun. Josie blinked to keep her eyes dry, and the vet took a step back, seeing he had inflicted pain. I'm sorry, he whispered. When I first read that section of that book, um, yeah, I, it made me cry. Uh -huh. And there were a lot of moments like that in this book where um, the interaction between the characters, although it's set in this context, this cru emotional crucible of deployment, which is alien to many Americans, the interactions between the people are very universal at moments like that um, and really hit home. Uh, and as a reader, you know, it would get the tear ducts going. Um, and I'm just wondering what the experience was like for you as a writer um, is it similarly, similarly emotional? Were you crying as you wrote it initially at all? Or is it a whole different experience technically as a writer as opposed to being a reader? Uh, I think you hit on something that was very important to me while I was writing the stories of um, wanting somebody who is outside of the military to still be able to relate to the themes and the stories um, so that it would resonate with whoever the reader might be. Um, and whether I get choked up a little, I, I, I didn't while I was writing, but sometimes, especially that particular story is one of the, I don't know, heavier stories in the collection. And if I read that aloud, I have a tendency to get a little choked up because, I mean, I can't help but sort of imagine my soldier and my husband in that role of Josie's husband. So. And while I was writing that story, that was, of course, any military spouse's biggest fear is that their soldier would not come back. 
So it was kind of close to me in writing it. But you kind of, you want to write the things that terrify you the most, you know, at least I do as a writer. So I, a different part of my brain is working while I'm writing the story. Yeah, I, I wondered about that, whether you hesitated to go there with the subject. I'm a military spouse, too. My husband also has served three combat deployments. Um, and that is that little fear at the back of your brain is there all the time, whether it shows or not. Um, and, and because it's sort of our worst nightmare, um, we don't necessarily want to talk about it because it brings those emotions right up. Um, you're very brave to want to go there. But did you hesitate also to kind of wade into this, what is a very real, it's our nightmare, but it didn't happen to our husbands. It's a very real pain for the people to whom it did happen. Did you hesitate to wade into that, knowing that that was, that you were going into territory that really isn't yours? Yeah, definitely. And hoping that I was tackling it in the right way and not too lightly. And it was, it was sort of a leap for me to write that story, but I unfortunately had been to funerals and um, I'm somebody who would look in a parking lot to see if someone's parked in that Gold Star parking lot. So I just wondered what if it was me pulling into it. So I, I think writers have to sort of take on maybe more than they think they can handle just in order to get it on the page. And if I didn't think it was working, and and I've had some widows read that particular story. Yeah, I was wondering if you'd heard back. back. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and both military and civilian widows have mentioned that that's that they connected to that story. So, yeah. But I, I worked on it a lot, and I didn't want it to be maudlin, and I didn't want to go in either one direction or the other, which I tried to walk that up particular line and I, I hope I it's a very fine line but I felt like you. you did um, and the ending I won't give it away but the ending is yeah it 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 it, it earns its ending oh, thank um, you. yeah um, so with in, in I want to stay with that um, and because the emotions that we process during a deployment uh, are often tucked away did did you feel like writing was a form of therapy for you? Because you were you started it between deployments. You'd been through it mm -hmm. through these previous deployments. Every one of them is different. You know, there's another one coming when you start writing these stories. Right. Was there any sense of this helps me cope with it while you were working on them? Uh, maybe, but I don't know if I was as conscious of it when I started yeah. writing. I um, my husband was a company commander, and I was a family readiness group leader. So I was the main contact for all of the um, family members of his 160 soldiers. So I was getting emails and phone calls every day from spouses, moms, dads, anyone who was worried when they saw an explosion on the news, you know, they they got in touch with me. And I, um, I had a very new insight into so many different lives mm -hmm. and or army family lives in that moment of, a very, you know, the heightened deployment schedule that we were going through in 2007, eight, and nine. Um, so I had more insight than I'd had as a military spouse before. And I was, I guess, trying to figure out why some people would make decisions that seemed odd to me, you know, and um, talking to a lot of younger soldiers and younger spouses who maybe got married very quickly you know, right before a deployment, and they didn't have the same support structure in the Army community that someone like me had, having been in, you know, a spouse for a while, and I was seeing them kind of fall through the cracks. So I was thinking a lot about those sorts of characters, and kind of haunted a little about not doing more as a, you know, military spouse or a family readiness group leader. So they were on my mind, and I kind of wanted to work it out in fiction and find maybe some more empathy for people who I thought were making some bad decisions and see wonder why they would do that. So I was working that kind of stuff out and and sure, I'm sure it helped me while my soldier was deployed, you know, I mean, unless I was thinking about things that might happen to him in the field, but yeah. still, just, just to stay busy. I mean, something we all do, you know, I'm sure you just do something to, and it was better than collecting stray cats which is what else I was doing the cat lady 
Um, you you said so you went through three combat deployments, um, and I'm was he and I'm sure the experience evolved from one to the next. So the first one, you would have been pretty green. Yeah. Um, but my understanding is that you were green to military life generally, mm -hmm. that you um, you know, came, came from a civilian family, didn't grow up in a military family. Um, so how, how did you write, when did you start writing? At what age? Oh gosh. I mean, when I started reading, I was one of those annoying little nerdy children who was always writing some sort of story and book and demanding my mother read it and make a big deal about it. So, so I, I always loved writing and really loved reading and storytelling. And um, my dad is from Ireland, and he was always sort of giving me books by Irish writers. So there was a little bit of that tradition of, you know, sort of respecting storytelling. And he's a bartender. And that's part of it is listening to other people's stories while you're bartending and me and my siblings we've all worked behind that bar and and listened to really incredible stories so i feel like it that was always part of my life and what then you went to the new school in new york city and got your mfa mm -hmm. um at, at when did you meet your husband i met my husband he had just graduated from um, the military academy at west point mm -hmm. and i was bartending my way through my mfa at the new school and he came in one night with a bunch of other guys from West Point. And um, I don't know, someone must have told him that I was a writer because he told me he was a poet. <laughs> I didn't I mention the soldier part. Well, <laughs> the soldier part and the more for the writing angle. And of course he is not a poet, but I mean, he's, he's an interesting writer. He'd write these incredible emails to me when he was deployed. And those details, I would make notes and keep them and put them in the back of my mind because I have not been to Iraq. But he was seeing the things that I wanted to be really alive in my stories. So he, he is such a tremendous help. Um, then, but you got your MFA in 2000 mm -hmm. and you had met him around that same time. Yes. And what I want to get at is what were you writing about before you met him? Mm -hmm. Because this book obviously is focused on the military community and that life. What were you writing about before you entered the military world? Uh, I don't know, sort of lighter stories about women in New York City or, I don't know, I guess very different, but all, I've always been really interested in, in relationships and what you do or do not know about the person you attach your life to. So I've been fascinated with that and communication and how people communicate. So. While this is very different, it, there are some themes that are the same now in what I was writing. And so, how would you how would you say that the the whole experience of being married to the military has shaped your perspective as a writer? Um, I don't know. It's sort of taught me that I can write wherever I am. Yeah. <laughs> we've moved a lot. With the, the army. Uh, we've moved eight times since we were married in two thousand and four. Um, and it's a really, I'm fortunate that it's a career I can take with me. You know, a lot of military spouses, they have to leave their jobs and go where the Army sends them. But I've got my laptop and take a lot of notes. And I really, I mean, that's probably the exciting aspect of military life for me is that we go to all these exciting new places. And Fort Hood felt, in a way, to me, like its own country. You know, it, it's, it's such a different place and had its own feel. And it was so saturated with... Um, what was going on in the Middle East in a way that the civilian community outside or where my family was in New York was not. So I, uh, to go back to you saying how I'm from a civilian family, like I, as a new bride, I was very aware of the differences of military life and civilian life. And while I was, when I was writing this book, I was trying to remember that newness and those really weird details when you're introduced to military life. Like what, what was the hardest thing or some of the hardest or strangest things that you had to adapt to in the beginning? Uh, I don't know, even something as simple as when you drive onto a base, you have to show your military ID. You know, they, they put a mirror under your car to make sure it's okay to get in. And you just, you don't have to do that when you go to Walmart, but you're, you know, you're heading to the commissary at Fort Hood. It, there's security, there's barbed wire around the entire installment. Um, and something I love about bases are, when they 
do the revelry, you know, and raise and lower the flag and how everyone stops. You know, the cars stop. Soldiers get out and they put their hand on their hearts and spouses do, or at least they, they stop. I so just there's just these details. And then you forget when you're on a base for a while, like you don't think it's strange that thousands of men are running PT at the crack of dawn and they are shutting off roads and you you know, you go around them because that's the way life is there. So I don't know. I try to infuse some of those details into the book. So in a way, you're you're giving people an inside look at this at this other world, um, and you're, I, I want to point out that the book has been chosen as um, by the Howard County Libraries as a community book, uh, and this is a primarily civilian community, mm-hmm. and they're being introduced to this world through your fiction, which um, to me is a really uh, interesting way to come at it. You know, I'm, I'm a journalist, so I come at it more from a, a fact-based background. And um, I have to say, when I first heard about your book, I think it was in 2011 when it came out, and I heard about it on the radio, by then I had a shelf full of nonfiction books by and about military spouses in wartime. And this was the first one I'd heard about taking, you know, coming at it from a fiction perspective. Um, and when I read it, it seemed just as true to me as the fact-based nonfiction. Um, so, you know, there can be a difference between truth and fact, mm-hmm. uh, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and particularly now that you're in this, uh, in the last couple of days, you've been immersed in a civilian community, talking about your book and the insights in it, uh, and the truths that are in it. Um, well, I, I wanted it to feel as true as possible. So thank you. I'm, I'm glad you you felt that it was a good representation, but. Um, I mean, the stories are fiction. I'm a fiction writer, and people ask me why I didn't go with a memoir or some sort of like nonfiction articles myself, and I, I kind of liked the distance of fiction and to be able to really look at a character in so many ways and to make there be a um, sort of drive to the plot, you know, tension and a climax and hopefully some sort of punch-in-the-gut ending. You know, I... I liked the form, and it seemed harder for me to take actual stories. And in my situation, I I would have felt like that was sort of invasive to my friends and peers and the members of my family readiness group leader. I mean, of course, I would have asked their permission, but um, it seemed more like I wanted to work on the themes that I saw during each of my husband's deployments and, and then use the details from Fort Hood, you know, Hell on Wheels. That's the name of a street in Fort Hood. You know, Battalion Avenue. Like, can't make that stuff I up. Know, I know, you can't. <laughs> Texas sort of becomes a character, and Fort Hood becomes a character because it's so specific. So that, that was fun to do, to kind of merge the the fact and the fiction together. What were some of the truths you were trying to get at, though? I mean, it, it is the fact, little mm-hmm. bits of facts that make it feel, feel very real. But um, you know, in the big truth with a capital T. What were you what were you digging at? I guess I as a as a military spouse, I I thought I was sort of witnessing so much more to our nation's like war story than what we were seeing on the news or in a magazine article or I don't know. Like we had such just this very simplified image of the soldier in Baghdad or in Kabul and with his kit on and you know the potential of getting hit by an IED and that seemed to sum up so much of it to average Americans and I wanted people to think about all the families who are attached to that soldier you know every single soldier who I mean we have soldiers in Afghanistan right now and they have families at home who think about them every day and are worried about them and making care packages and getting through, you know, one phone call to the next and just hoping they're going to be all right. So that seemed like there was enough drama there on the home front to write about and hope that people, you know, it would just give them a different glimpse, you know, the flip side of it. And yeah, it's an attempt. Yeah, well, I think a successful one. Because you. Um, you were writing about what you know, which is the advice that is right. given to writers, mm-hmm. um, which 
is most of the time true, not necessarily not necessary, necessarily true. Um, science fiction writers might argue with that. <laughs> um, but when you were writing what you knew and offering insight to both fellow military spouses, kind of giving them a handle to to examine what they'd experienced and civilians to gain some insight into this world. Um, did you yourself learn anything in the process of writing about this? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, being a military spouse is sort of a process in its own right of learning more and more about what the Army or the Navy or, you know, the Marines offer families. Um, and each different base has its own feel to it. But uh, I... I'm not joking when I think, I feel like I learned more empathy when I was creating my characters than I might have had with actual living people that I was talking to. You know, I might get impatient with the woman who still didn't have her TRICARE signed up, you know, <laughs> and not thinking she's 24 and she has three children and she has no car and it's just... And, but when I would write about a character like that, I, I understood what she was going through more. So I think it made me a better um, family readiness group leader, or it made me a better military spouse so that I, hopefully, in the next situation, you know, I'll be more willing to reach out to the spouses I think need, need a hand. So, so I, I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> Are there more deployments on the future for, in the future for you? I know your husband's shifted from infantry now to um, a foreign yes, foreign area oh, foreign officer. area officer. Yeah, he uh, he will probably do some sort of deployment. We um, so we're stationed in the Middle East as a family, mm -hmm. hopefully for the most part. But he could always get a post that um, doesn't allow for families, like Yemen or I don't know Saudi Arabia, depending mm -hmm. on the rules at the time. But uh, the army, I feel like there's this ticking clock and they know how long it's been since you've been deployed. So if he doesn't get something like Yemen, um, he will probably deploy to a more traditional, you know, to Afghanistan or something. But um, I'm crossing my fingers that we get a little bit more time together. And right now we're in Abu Dhabi for two years, which is an amazing amount of family time to have. I don't know. So I'm very happy. Are you working on something new and while you're over there in Abu Dhabi? I'm working on a novel mm -hmm. and it's uh, set in the Middle East. It's set in Jordan and um, a little bit about the clash of cultures of Americans living abroad and trying to figure out this Arab slash Muslim world that we're living in and, and not be the ugly American, you know, <laughs> and get things right. And especially from a woman's perspective living in that world. And, fascinates me so is, it'll fascinate a reader <laughs> is it still does it still have a military component or is it yeah, are you moving away from that a little bit there's some military characters and civilian characters and it, it's set up um, in the embassy community which has that kind of mix but is again sort of its own enclave you know in within a larger world than you have the embassy world so similar in a way to Fort Hood that place and then the surrounding place and how they work together. And how is the transition from stories to novel going? Because this, the process of writing a story is so different. You can leave things in the middle of the action, which mm. I know is one of the hallmarks of this book. You leave people hanging sometimes and uh, make them make them finish the story. And you have less opportunity to do that in a novel. Yeah. Are you? Do you like that? Do you have a preference for one over the other? Well, I haven't finished the novel yet, so I'm, sure. so, I know I'm missing short stories, but um, I mean, just 300 pages is so much more unwieldy than a bunch of 30-page segments, so I don't know, cross your fingers, please, <laughs> I can handle all of those, because you, know, you still have as much stuff up in the air, but then, as you say, it all has to tie together yeah. more seamlessly. So. When you're writing the stories, are you the kind of writer who just kind of starts without knowing where you're going and see where the, the story takes you, or do you have an ending or a structure in mind? Do you do like a little three-act structure or an outline? Some stories are, are different. I don't know. Sometimes I have a very clear ending, and I work toward that ending. And then some of them, I have an image that's in the beginning, and I start there and go. So I'll never know what'll seize me. Mm. Would you like to read one more 
piece from your book for us? Sure. So um, Gold Star was from the point of view of one of the female characters, and um, the stories sort of go back and forth between the male point of view or soldier point of view and the spouse point of view. So I thought I'd just read a paragraph or two from one of the um, soldiers' points of view. And this is um, Camp Liberty from the um, point of view of Sergeant Moog. And he's just come back from leave to New York. Of course, when he did get back to Baghdad, he told everyone what they wanted to hear, that the food in New York had never been better, filet mignon and fried calamari that melted in his mouth, beer so cold it stung his tongue, gin tonics and vodka martinis, and making love to his girlfriend at least three times a day. <laughs> his runny nose immediately dried up and he felt alert again, awake at dawn to the call to prayer that reverberated around the base. It was as if his body had grown dependent on the 120 degree days and the 40 degree nights, the long sleeved camouflage uniform and the heavy lace up boots, the weight of the helmet and the 40 pound Kevlar vest, the tinny water fed into his mouth by a warm tube from the camelback slung over his shoulder, the churned out high calorie eggs at the chow hall in the morning, the dried out MRE bagged meals in the afternoon, sleep-deprived nights of helicopters, landing or mortars ringing with the usual bad aim against the perimeter of the base. His body thrived in the desert, and Moog was seized with a terrible thought. What if, after all of his longing to get out and get on with his life, in his comfortable middle age, he would look back at this time and realize that his years in the army were the most vivid, the most startlingly real of his entire life, Maybe he should not be getting out after all. I think that's probably true for a lot of military spouses too, that it's a very vivid time. Well, Siobhan, I want to thank you for talking with us about your experiences as a military spouse and how they've influenced your writing. Thank you, Kristen. And it's been a pleasure being here. Thanks, Don. And thank you all for joining us for Hoko Pulitzo's The Writing Life. Thank you.